Hi everyone, my name's Harry Sadler. I'm going to be reading this evening for you some of Jane Austen's Juvenilia. Oh, there it is. <laughs> um, we all know Jane Austen, obviously. I don't need to go into any introductions. Not, most of us aren't so familiar with the stuff that she wrote when she was a kid. And it, when I put it like that, it doesn't sound very promising, but actually it's some of the funniest stuff that's ever been written in the English language. I think so. I'm going to write a write, I'm going to read to you one of her very very early pieces. I don't know how old she was when she wrote this. She was a teenager or something ridiculous. Anyway, this is called Frederick and Elfrida, a novel. Chapter the first. The uncle of Elfrida was the father of Frederick. In other words, they were first cousins by the father's side. Being both born in one day and both brought up at one school, it was not wonderful that they should look on each other with something more than bare politeness. They loved with mutual sincerity, but were both determined not to transgress the rules of propriety, with a capital P, by owning their attachment either to the object beloved or to anyone else. They were exceedingly handsome and so much alike that it was not everyone who knew them apart. Nay, even their most intimate friends had nothing to distinguish them by but the shape of the face, the colour of the eye, the length of the nose, and the difference of the complexion. Other than that, almost identical. Elfrida had an intimate friend to whom, being on a visit to an aunt, she wrote the following letter. To Miss Drummond. Dear Charlotte, I should be obliged to you if you would buy me, during your stay with Mrs Williamson, a new and fashionable bonnet to suit the complexion of your E. Falconer. Charlotte, whose character was a willingness, a willingness to oblige everyone, when she returned into the country, brought her friend the wished-for bonnet, and so ended this little adventure much to the satisfaction of all parties. On her return to Crankham Dunbury, of which sweet village her father was rector, Charlotte was received with the greatest joy, also a capital J, by Frederick and Elfrida, who, after pressing her alternately to their bosoms, proposed to her to take a walk in a grove of poplars which led from the parsonage to a verdant lawn enamelled with a variety of variegated flowers and watered by a purling stream brought from the valley of Tempe by a passage underground. In this grove they had scarcely remained above nine hours when they were suddenly agreeably surprised by hearing a most delightful voice warble the following stanza. This is, this is marked as a song. I don't have a most agreeable or most delightful voice, so I'm just going to read it out as prose, sorry. That Damon was in love with me, I once thought and believed. But now that he is not, I see, I fear, I was deceived. No sooner, no sooner were the lines finished than they beheld by a turning in the grove two elegant young women leaning on each other's arm, who immediately, on perceiving them, took a different path and disappeared from their sight. Chapter the Second as Elfrida and her companions had seen enough of them to know that they were neither the two Miss Greens nor Mrs Jackson and her daughter, they could not help expressing their surprise at their appearance, till at length recollecting that a new family had lately taken a house not far from the grove, they hastened home determined to lose no time in forming an acquaintance with two such amiable and worthy girls, of which family they rightly imagined them to be a part. Agreeable to such a determination, they went that very evening to pay their respects to Mrs Fitzroy and her two daughters. On being shown into an elegant dressing room ornamented with festoons of artificial flowers, they were struck with the engaging exterior and beautiful outside of Jezalinda, the eldest of the young ladies, but ere they had been 
many minutes seated the wit and charms which shone resplendent in the conversation of the amiable Rebecca, enchanted them so much that they all, with one accord, jumped up and exclaimed, Lovely and too charming, fair one, notwithstanding your forbidden squint, your greasy tresses and your swelling back, which are more frightful than imagination can paint or pen describe, I cannot refrain from expressing my raptures at the engaging qualities of your mind, which so amply atone for the horror with which your first appearance must ever inspire the unwary visitor. Hush. Your sentiments so nobly expressed on the different excellencies of Indian and English Muslims and the judicious preference you give the former have excited in me an admiration of which I can alone give an adequate idea by assuring you it is nearly equal to what I feel for myself. Then making a profound curtsy to the amiable and abashed Rebecca, they left the room and hurried home. From this period, the intimacy between the families of Fitzroy, Drummond and Falconer daily increased till at length it grew to such a pitch that they did not scruple to kick one another out of the window on the slightest provocation. During this happy state of harmony, the eldest Miss Fitzroy ran off with the coachman, and the amiable Rebecca was asked in marriage by Captain Roger of Buckinghamshire. Yes. Mrs Fitzroy did not approve of the match, uh -uh. on account of the tender years of the young couple, Rebecca being but 36, and Captain Roger little more than 63. He's a whippersnapper, what's he thinking? To remedy this objection, it was agreed that they should wait a little while till they were a good deal older. <laughs> Chapter the Third. In the meantime, the parents of Frederick proposed to those of Elfrida an union between them, which being accepted with pleasure, the wedding clothes were brought and nothing remained to be settled but the naming of the day. As to the lovely Charlotte, being importuned with eagerness to pay another visit to her aunt, she determined to accept the invitation and in consequence of it walked to Mrs Fitzroy's to take leave of the amiable Rebecca, whom she found surrounded by patches, powder, pomatum and paint, with which she was vainly endeavouring to remedy the natural plainness of her face. I am come, my amiable Rebecca, to take my leave of you for the fortnight I am destined to spend with my aunt. Believe me, this separation is painful to me, but it is as necessary as the labour which now engages you. Why, to tell you the truth, my love, replied Rebecca, I have lately taken it into my head to think, perhaps with little reason, that my complexion is by no means equal to the rest of my face, and have therefore taken, as you see, to white and red paint which I should, which I would scorn to use on any other occasion, as I hate art. With a heavy heart, oh, sorry, wrong paragraph, Charlotte, who perfectly understood the meaning of her friend's speech, was too good-tempered and obliging to refuse her what she knew she wished, a compliment, and they parted the best friends in the world. With a heavy heart and streaming eyes did she ascend the lovely vehicle which bore her from her friends and home, but grieved as she was, she little thought in what a strange and different manner she should return to it. On her entrance into the city of London, which was the place of Mrs Williamson's abode, the postillion, whose stupidity, whose stupidity was amazing, declared and declared, even without the least shame of compunction, that having never been informed, he was totally ignorant of what part of the town he was to drive to. That was fair enough. Charlotte, whose nature we have before intimated, was an earnest desire to oblige everyone with the greatest condescension and good humour informed him that he was to drive to Portland Place, which he accordingly did, and Charlotte soon found herself in the arms of a fond aunt. Where would Austin be without the aunts? Honestly, the 
is central. Scarcely were they seated as usual in the most affectionate manner in one chair than the door suddenly opened and an aged gentleman with a sallow face and an old pink coat, partly by intention and partly through weakness, was at the feet of the lovely Charlotte, declaring his attachment to her and beseeching her pity in the most moving manner. Not being able to resolve to make any one miserable, she consented to become his wife, whereupon the gentleman left the room and all was quiet. Quick job. Well done. Their quiet, however, continued but a short time, for on a second opening of the door, a young and handsome gentleman with a new blue coat, ooh, I have a blue coat, entered and entreated from the lovely Charlotte permission to pay her his addresses. There was a something in the appearance of the second stranger that influenced Charlotte in his favour. To the full as much as the appearance of the first, she could not account for it, but so it was. It's like that sometimes, isn't it? Having therefore agreeable to that and the, and the natural turn of her mind to make everyone happy, promised to become his wife the next morning, he took his leave and the two ladies sat down to supper on a young leveret, a brace of partridges, a leash of pheasants, and a dozen pigeons. It's a light supper. Chapter the Fourth It was not till the next morning that Charlotte recollected the double engagement she had entered into, but when she did, the reflection of her past folly operated so strongly on her mind that she resolved to be guilty of a greater, and to that end threw herself into a deep stream which ran through her aunt's pleasure grounds in Portland Place. Cripes. She floated to Crank Humdunbury, where she was picked up and buried. The following epitaph, composed by Frederick, I was wondering where he got to, Elfrida and Rebecca was placed on her tomb. Epitaph. Here lies our friend who, having promised that unto two she would be married, through her sweet body and her lovely face, don't forget the face, into the stream that runs through Portland Place. No good. These sweet lines, as pathetic as beautiful, were never read by anyone who passed that way without a shower of tears which if they should fail of exciting in you, reader, your mind must be unworthy to peruse them. And that's that. Having performed the last sad office to their departed friend, Frederick and Elfrida, together with Captain Roger and Rebecca, returned to Mrs Fitzroy's, at whose feet they threw themselves with one accord and addressed her in the following manner. Madam, when the sweet Captain Roger first addressed the amiable Rebecca, you alone objected to their union on account of the tender years of the parties. That plea can be no more, seven days being now expired, together with the lovely Charlotte, since the Captain first spoke to you on the subject. Consent then, madam, to their union, and as a reward... This smelling bottle, which I enclose in my right, right hand, shall be yours and yours forever. I never will claim it again. But if you refuse to join their hands in three days' time, this dagger, which I enclose in my left, shall be steeped in your heart's blood. Jesus. Speak then, madam, and decide their fate and yours. Such gentle and sweet persuasion... <laughs> could not fail of having the desired effect. No kidding. The answer they received was this. My dear young friends, the arguments you have used are too just and too eloquent to be withstood. Not to mention too pointy. Rebecca, in three days' time, you shall be united to the captain. This speech, than which nothing could be more satisfactory, was received with joy by all, and peace being once more restored on all sides, Captain Roger entreated Rebecca to favour them with a song. 
in compliance with which request having first assured them that she had a terrible cold, she sung as follows. You know how songs go, you know what I'm going to do. Song. When Coridon went to the fair, he bought a red ribbon for Bess, with which she encircled her hair and made herself look very fess. Chapter the Fifth At the end of three days, Captain Roger and Rebecca were united and immediately after the ceremony set off in a stage wagon for the captain's seat in Buckinghamshire. The parents of Elfrida, although they earnestly wished to see her married to Frederick before they died, yet knowing the delicate frame of her mind, could ill bear the least exertion, and rightly judging that naming her wedding day would be too great a one, forbore to press her on the subject. Weeks and fortnights flew away without gaining the least ground. Clothes grew out of fashion, and at length Captain Roger and his lady arrived to pay a visit to their mother and introduce to her their beautiful daughter of 18. That's a long time to wait. Elfrida, who had found her former acquaintance, were growing too old and too ugly to be any longer agreeable, was rejoiced to hear of the arrival of so pretty a girl as Eleanor, with whom she determined to form the strictest friendship. But the happiness she had expected from an acquaintance with Eleanor, she soon found was not to be received. For she had not only the mortification of finding herself treated by her as little less than an old woman, I don't like Eleanor, but had actually the horror of perceiving a growing passion in the bosom of Frederick, oh come on Frederick, for the daughter of the amiable Rebecca. The instant she had the first idea of such an attachment, she flew to Frederick and in a manner truly heroic, spluttered out to him her intention of being married the next day. To one in his predicament who possessed less personal courage than Frederick was master of, such a speech would have been death, with a capital D. But he, not being the least terrified, boldly replied, so this, this next word is spelled D-A-M-M-E, and I assume it's dame and not damn. Dame Elfrida, you may be married tomorrow, but I won't. Damn. This answer distressed her too much for her delicate constitution. She accordingly fainted and was in such a hurry to have a succession of fainting fits that she had scarcely patience enough to recover from one before she fell into another. Though in any threatening danger to his life or liberty, Frederick was as bold as brass, yet in other respects his heart was as soft as cotton, and immediately on hearing of the dangerous way Elfrida was in, he flew to her, and finding her better than he had been taught to expect, was united to her for ever. The end. So, that was Jane Austen, as you possibly aren't very familiar with her. Everything in this is great. Doesn't have all of her juvenilia. Actually, I haven't read it all, to be honest. I'm going to go out on a limb and say everything in it is great because this Jane Austen now is not going to be great. Anyway, thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed it and I'm looking forward to hearing what someone is going to read next. Bye.